been fun. You know, we just finished that, uh, that other Torah cycle. We're all set to begin a new one. You know, for those that went to Shomer uh, last Monday, you were able to participate, you know, in the, in the Torah being carried around. I'm going to have to embarrass a few of y'all a little bit. Huh? What's that? Oh, do you? But it's not going to be up there. Not to, you know, not if I have anything to say about it. I control, I have the power. I have the remote. Yep. But, you know, the Torah scroll being carried around the room. And then uh, other, other scrolls as well that got carried around a little bit. Which one was that one? Was that one of the, one of the prophets? or? No, I don't think that's the Esther. That's not the Esther scroll. But uh, it's an exciting thing to carry that around. You know, about 40, 45 pounds. It's a, it's a joy and an honor. And then we got to see and watch the, the scroll get rolled back from you know, the last verse of Deuteronomy to the first verse of Genesis. Got to see what, the, what all of those parchments and all those pieces sewn together looks like. We had a good group that came. I hope you all enjoyed it. But, uh, he, of course, you could point out some things from time to time about uh, what was there in the text. Uh, you use that little pointer because you don't want your fingers actually touching it, uh, touching the oil, because the oils off your fingers will corrupt and ruin the parchment and such. But we're back. Back in Genesis. And it's been a little while since I've you know, been going straight through the Torah like this. But it's a good thing. You know, it's a blessing and an honor to carry the Torah around. It, it really establishes that authority of the Word of God. And, you know, it still amazes me when you're looking at those things to see the scroll back, uh, roll back, to see some of those details, some of that, uh, the text, the history, the process that goes even into one of them. It is very impressive. And then back in Genesis chapter 1, in this first Torah section, and there is so much digging that can be done in these first chapters and in numerous places. Uh, and just a couple of examples of some things that uh, before we get to what I believe the Father wanted me to talk about today, and, you know, so many of these things that even I'm going to share here are ones that I'm not necessarily experts in, uh, an expert in, but that it takes me to hear from others that are good at the digging kind of things. But this is the opening line of the book of Genesis. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim et hararetz. Right? You can look at it and you can see it's seven words. Is, is seven an important or significant number? Right? Yeah, it sure is. This center one here is the Aleph Tav, you know, what we would also equivalent to the Alpha and the Omega, right? The Aleph Tav, the first and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And, you know, grammatically, it's really just designating the object. You know, this is in the beginning, you know, the verb created, who did it? That the Hebrew is actually a very straightforward, basic and simple language in many respects. It's who did it and what did they do? And then the Aleph Tav signifies like the direct object and who is being acted upon or what is being acted upon. So God created the who did it, what did they do, and who was affected by it? Heavens and the earth. Y'all with me? There's a lot of things you could just say about this whole statement. Um, one of the things when you're looking at that, the first letter over here is the bait, right? And it has a symbol meaning of what? It's like a house. Right? You've got your house and structure here with the open door. And the, so it's pronounced bait, but then that's the last letter of that, the tav. So the first word has the word house built into it. God is creating a household of 
people. He is bringing people together as his children. And there's a whole lot more you can say about just that one word that uh, I certainly don't have all the expertise in. But um, then when you look at some of these first letters, that, or these ending letters of these first words, right? that's the Tav over there, that's the Aleph, the first letter, then the Mame. A lot of times the rabbinic scholars, the rabbis and such will look at those types of patterns and they'll rearrange those words and they come up with this word here. Does anybody know what that one is? Amen. Emet, which means truth. Right? So just in those first three words, his word is truth. Another example of some of the, the depths to which you can dig in all of this. This is the word bara, which is he created. First word is bet, and uh, it's the, also the first word or first letter for the word bar or ben, which means son. The resh is the next one, and that's often that's associated with the first word of the word ruach, which is spirit. And then aleph is the first letter of the word av, father. So even in that word, you have Father, Son, and Spirit. Interesting stuff, right? There's a, and again, there's a whole lot of things, a lot of depths you can dig into this. You know, God speaks ten times in the course of chapter one. He has ten words that he says, which reminds us of the Ten Commandments. Right? He, he has eight creative acts, eight is a symbol of the, the letter, or sorry, the number eight symbolizes new beginnings or the new era, new earth, new heaven, new earth, new world. And it can be a little, when you start digging into some of these kind of things, it can be very overwhelming. And you can find all sorts of things, some of it good, some of it more questionable than others. But you're never going to dig deep, dig out all of the nuggets from these opening chapters. And I, I certainly, again, don't have all the skill or expertise to do this kind of stuff. Um, but from, for some, you know, you've been through the Torah cycle many times, right? How many of you have gone through the Torah cycle more than five times? Okay, there's a few hands out there. How many of you have gone through it more than two times? Okay, there's more hands. How many of this is your first time going, starting from at the beginning of the Torah cycle? Okay, you might have jumped in somewhere in the middle, but this is the first time starting it and going through it. And that's, a, that's an exciting time. Because you're, we're starting for the first time, you'll be starting the first time going through the Torah on the cycle and on the schedule that the Jewish people have been doing for thousands of years around the world, and they're all doing it together. That's one of the special things about it, and that, to me, is amazing. Reading with people on that kind of schedule that has been used for thousands of years. And this first time going through it, starting from the beginning, I guarantee you, you're going to see it differently this time. Because I'm sure you've probably read it all before, or most of it. You might get bogged down a little bit in, in Leviticus or Numbers before, right? But you're going to have to read it this time. But you're going to find things. You're going to see things. You're going to read things in there. You're going to notice things in there that you hadn't noticed before. And you're going to hear and read some things that don't get preached very often, right? But these opening chapters, I mean, they set the stage and the tone of, of the primary character of Scripture. Right? Who is the primary character of all of Scripture? Well, God is, right? In the beginning, God. Yeah, it's, it's, I know what you mean. <laughs> God is the focal point of all of Scripture. It's, it's not about us. God is the focal point 
of, of everything that's happening and what he is doing. So it lays the foundation for us. It lays the foundation for human experience and why the world is the way it is today and why we have a longing for something different. I mean, if this is all the world that's ever been, why do we have this sense of uh, something is wrong? Something is broken. Something is not right. We have a longing for a better world for some reason. And Genesis gives us the explanation. Most of you know that, that Genesis, you know, its meaning, its interpretation divides a lot of people, divides a lot of churches, divides a lot of uh, scholars and everything else like that. You know, is this, is this to be historical or is this just figurative? Is this literal? Is it, is it a day? Is it an age? Right? Y'all have heard all that stuff before. How can you understand and interpret this, these opening chapters, this opening chapter, how you would do that, how you interpret this, even this first chapter, shapes how you interpret the rest of Scripture, including Messiah, including the work that he does on our behalf. And if you reject the worldview established by these opening chapters of Genesis, that has some serious consequences for any culture. Any culture that rejects Genesis in these opening chapters is going to have some problems. Okay? There are consequences for that. And so when you think about our, our friends, our family, people that we know out there at work or whatever, no matter where you are politically, we can all agree, we should all be able to agree that we, our culture is struggling in a lot of ways, struggling with its identity, struggling with its values, struggling with its direction and future, struggling even with its past and foundation systems. You hear all these things talked about all the time. And all of these problems that we are having now, or most of them anyway, all these things that are up in the air, they come because of this divide between the worldview and how we understand who we are, how we got here, what are we doing? What's our purpose? Most, if not all, of our current cultural issues stems from a rejection of elements within Genesis. And our divide, you know, as we'll get to, is, is, is so fundamental, so foundational that much of our time is even, we're, we're at the point now that we're even arguing over the definition of words and what do they mean. You know, what is a woman? What is marriage? When does life begin? What is justice? You think about that first verse again. In the beginning, Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, many in the world today reject the first three words. In the beginning, the English words anyway. In the beginning. That you're already getting into trouble with some people. Just on those words alone. You know, in the early 1900s, Einstein had this concept of the eternal or steady state universe. That was comfortable. It stated that the universe had no beginning and no end. And so rejecting the Bible, rejecting Genesis as a starting point for understanding the world, that was pretty easy and that was pretty comfortable. It actually became more uncomfortable. Well, basically, here's the thing. If the universe always was, you know, if everything that we see in this material world, if the universe is all there was and all there ever has been, then the Bible cannot be true. The Bible, always, if, the, if the universe always was, if the universe always will be, then we really don't have to worry about judgment. We don't really have to worry about any kind of accountability because things are just going to keep going on and going on and, and never end. Then back in the, I guess, the 40s and 50s, what we now call you know, the Big Bang Theory, when that started gaining some of its traction, it was actually not the religious people that had a problem with the Big Bang Theory at first. It was the scientific community that had a problem with it. They were terrified by the prospect of the Big Bang Theory because suddenly the idea that the universe had a beginning of some kind might lead people to think that the Bible might actually be true. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that the Big Bang Theory is true, mind you, but the world was really struggling with what it meant. Could the universe have a beginning? A culture that rejects the beginning rejects the God that created that beginning. And it's a world that rejects God, it rejects a creation, rejects a beginning, rejects a mind behind this existence, is going to be struggling with meaning and with purpose. Because a world, a universe without God, without a creative mind, intentionally acting and creating, bara, means that everything has no meaning. That everything is random, everything is unintentional, un everything is accidental. It is just pure chance that we are here at all. In rejecting those first three words, the universe takes no notice and has no care of our existence in that world. The materialistic perspective that only matter and energy exist, that the universe is all there ever was, will be, rejects meaning and purpose as if you try to subscribe, if you try to not subscribe, ascribe meaning and purpose to life, to existence, to this world, if you're trying to do that in the midst of all of this randomness, you're just self-deluding yourself. Our beginning in that world and that understanding that rejects the first three words, our beginning is an accident and has no meaning. And our ending is an accident and has no meaning, which makes everything in between, all, all of our lives also, everything that we experience also is an accident and has no meaning. That quickly spirals down into what is called well, the earth was chaos and waste. I mean, they, they'll, they'll focus on that part. Yeah, it's, it's chaos, it's waste. They may not understand what those words mean, but they'll say, yep, yeah, that's pretty much everything. Darkness was on the surface of the deep and the Ruach Elohim was hovering upon the surface of the water. But this is a doctrine, this attitude of, of meaninglessness spirals down into what's called nihilism. The doctrine that nothing actually exists or that existence or values are meaningless. And it's a relentless negativity or cynicism, which suggesting of an absence of values or beliefs. Nietzsche was one that exemplified this perspective by saying, you know, the radical repudiation of value, meaning, and desirability. Y'all have heard probably the phrase with his famous phrase about God is dead, right? That was taken from this type of perspective, but he, at least he had the honesty to, to discuss the consequences of it. If you're really going to go there and that's the kind of world you want to create, realize you're going to be increasing despair, hopelessness, disorientation, suicide. I mean, those aren't anything going on in our culture right now, are they? The belief that we just came from nothing, and when our life is over, we just kind of blink out of existence and nothing happens has consequences. Because the belief that there is no God, nothing but an, uh, you know, an explosion brought about uh, this universe through natural processes, you know, it ultimately rejects the significance of our lives and the reality of, of the decisions that we make with any meaning. There surely you would think there can't be any possible connection between rejecting God and rejecting creation. Surely there's no connection to the fact that there is a rising suicide issue in our country right now. You know, when you, there was an article earlier this year from March 15th, where it says that suicide is the second leading cause of death among people aged 15 to 24. Surely there's no connection, right? The world has no meaning. My life has no purpose. Rejecting creation is also a rejection 
of that idea of accountability uh, and judgment. Because if, if we're here by accident and no, nobody created anything, nobody brought this into existence, then, you know, who am I going to be held accountable by? I, I answer to no one. And so I can there do what I want. You know, because even what I do, how I live, how I treat others, also is meaningless and irrelevant. Who I hurt along the way is meaningless and irrelevant. I might as well do what I want, experience anything I want, because everything I do is nothing. Everyone I hurt is nothing. Everything is meaningless. I mean, Solomon came to those conclusions when you read in the book of Ecclesiastes. He figured that out. None of it matters. Everything is vapor. Everything, you know, fades. And that leads to a generation. That type of attitude, that type of mentality, that type of existence leads to the kind of generation that we see at the end of this Torah portion. Genesis chapter 6. Adonai saw that the wickedness of humankind was great on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their heart was only evil <coughs> all the time. <clears throat> are we getting closer to that? Are there people who are already there? Yeah, there are. Every kind of evil, every evil, evil desire will be embraced Moral, social order falls apart. Because there is no one to be accountable to. Crime and injury and destruction increases in the culture that rejects the truth that God created this universe, created our world, created our lives. Because the creation is part of his Torah, right? It's the opening words. And as Yeshua talked about, as Torahlessness increases, as lawlessness increases, as a rejection of God's law, his Torah, increases, what happens to our love and our concern for others? It decreases. It grows cold. As Torahlessness increases, the love of many grows cold. Because they, they get to the point where they don't care about anybody but themselves and what they're able to get out of a particular moment, the experience, the pleasure, whatever it is out of the particular moment, what it does to you is doesn't matter because you don't matter. The culture that rejects a special creation, you know, in accepting things like the evolutionary theory or even the, the compromised attempts of theistic evolution that God directed or nudged the process along to his desired outcome. If you accept that, and again, in rejecting some of the elements of, of the special creation, you have to also then accept that death has always been a part of this world. In fact, death is a necessary part of this world because death and decay, you know, survival of the fittest, random mutation, you know, all of those things are some of the most essential mechanisms for that whole evolutionary process to work. You have to have death in order for it to work at all. And it had to be at work for all of those millions of years in order to get to the more complex animals and humans that we see today. Death and time. You know, if you didn't really realize this or recognize this, the, you know, the, how many of y'all remember how old they were saying the universe was when you were young or in high school right now they're saying it's like 14 and a half 15 billion years old right it wasn't that old when i was in high school it was maybe four and a half five or six billion years old i feel like i'm talking about the national debt or something but um it just keeps getting bigger it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger Every time they revise the number, it never gets smaller. You know why? Because the whole, the evolution's mechanisms require those lengths of time to even be plausible. It's completely ridiculous 
without those kind of numbers. Time is the, the magic variable that allows the proposed mechanisms to work. It's got to have those kind of time frames in order to be available, uh, in order to get to the place where we are now. You know, that magic variable of time is what they also say will eventually allow for all the species that we see today in the same way that given enough time, if you put 100 chimpanzees down at a, at a typewriter and a computer, they'll eventually be able to type out Hamlet, given enough time. It's not going to happen. They have to have time. And so it will always, the number will always keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But when you, when you require death, when you require time, you're rejecting what Genesis has to say. Because in that case, you know, death, for example, is not the result of sin entering into the world with Adam and Eve. Because they, they're probably not even real anyway, right? But it's a necessary and essential element in this world. And it's how this world has always been. So that means there was no Garden of Eden. There was no state of innocence. There was no perfection. No pain. So, you know, essentially what we've got to come to terms with then is that pain and suffering that we go through in this world were always a part of this world. And they always will be a part of this world, and it will never change. The feeling that something is wrong in this world, that inexplicable longing for a better world is just wrong thinking. Or as more and more of the, the advanced scientists and speculative people, theater, theater, theoreticians, am I getting that word right? You know, more and more of them are starting to accept the idea that we actually are actually a part of a simulation. This is part of the matrix, right? You've heard, you've seen those articles. And see, when people begin rejecting more and more the beginning of the world, they lose hope that it's ever going to be any different. They lose hope that it will ever be restored, that it will ever get better, that there will ever be an end to this kind of suffering, that there will ever be an end to this pain. By not recognizing Genesis, by not recognizing and realizing the, the problem of sin and its unleashed destruction, it's no accident, it's no surprise that such a culture will increasingly reject the cure. They don't recognize that there's a problem. They don't recognize what the problem is. Then they're not going to even be looking for the cure. And that is Messiah. Messiah is the cure to all of that. But if you reject Adam and Eve, if you, if you reject sin coming into the world through their actions, through their decisions, what do I need him for? It's all, always been like this. So the rejection of creation is directly proportional to the rejection of Yeshua. And they also reject the return of Messiah. Because if he's not really real in the first place, what do I have to worry about a second coming for? A promise of a restored garden? Because this world's going to be different? Says who? Second Peter talks about that. First of all, understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing, following after their own desires and saying, where is this promise of his coming? And why do they reject the, his coming? Ever since the fathers died, everything goes on as it has on just as it has from the beginning of creation. It's not going to be any different. This world's going to has been doing this for all along. In geology, that's called the principle of uniformitarianism. Right? All the processes, all the things that we see active and at work today have the way it's always been. They reject his second coming because they reject the beginning. For in holding to this idea, it escapes their notice that the heavens existed long ago and that the earth was formed out of water and through water by what? The word of God. They're rejecting all of this truth about Messiah because they reject the beginning. 
They reject those first few chapters of Genesis. And in rejecting Genesis, the only conclusion is that this world that we, this life that we have now, this is the best it's ever going to be. It will only, and this is, this is where it gets dangerous. This is the, this is the best the world is ever going to be. And it will only be better, not if God makes it better, but if we make it better ourselves. Because in their mindset, no one is coming to save us. No one is coming to fix it. So this planet is all that we have, and we have to save it ourselves. And to achieve that goal, you know, saving the planet, that's why that whole environmental and all the other types of movements that are out there are a faith and a belief and a religion. Saving the planet is a religion. Yeah. More and more, those kind of people understand that the problem is not sin, but, you know, it's, it's carbon emissions, it's overpopulation, it's climate change. And if they identify the problem as those things, then everything that these elites are doing to reduce the food supply, reduce oil and gas supplies, promote abortion, promote euthanasia, all that makes sense. If that's what they really believe, that this world is the best it's ever going to be, and we have to fix it ourselves because God's not coming to fix it for us, then everything they're doing makes sense. Because they're just trying to get to their goal of saving the planet. Y'all with me? Faith in Christ is not their solution. In fact, those who embrace Christ, those who believe in Messiah, those are the ones that are increasingly the problem because they're most more likely to resist, to not agree, to not go along with where they want to go. That's why we're seeing you know, more and more people uh, get arrested you know, who are pro-life. That's why you're seeing more and more people get arrested who are not getting with the program or getting the vaccines or whatever else. More and more of those who reject Genesis begin to worship the creation, right? And spiral into depravity. That's how Paul talks about it in Romans chapter one. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. In unrighteousness, they suppress emit. They suppress the truth. Because what can be known about God is plain to them, for God has shown it to them. Well, how did he show it to them? Well, all his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen ever since the creep. What? The, the what? Uh, well, if they reject creation, what can they not see? They don't recognize any of those things if they reject creation. They have been clearly seen ever since the creation of the world being understood through the things that have been made. So people are without excuse. They're, they're not seeing because they don't want to see. They're believing something else. They have another God, another reason, something else to explain who they are, why we're here, how, why is the world the way it is. He says, for even though they knew God, you know, it's some of the, the people who believe in God the most are the ones who are the atheists who say they believe in the least. It's one of those statements, why are you so angry at somebody you don't believe exists? They actually believe in him more than most of us do. But they did not glorify him as God or give him thanks. Instead, their thinking became futile and their senseless hearts were made dark. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. There's a lot of smart people that, do, that reject the creation, or reject Genesis, aren't there? And they come up with a lot of very, very intelligent, very smart sounding concepts and ideas, but how does scripture describe it? They're wasting their time. 
and their hearts are senseless. They have become darkened. They actually think they're smart, but they really became fools. You know, the fool in his heart says what? There is no God. And they then exchange the glory of the immortal God for an image in the form of mortal man, birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them over. So the fact that they were rejecting Genesis and the creator and the beginnings, they began to worship other things, then it affected their behavior. God gave them over to in the evil desires of their hearts, to impurity, to dishonor their bodies with one another. And they traded the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. When they begin to worship the creation, the creation is what becomes more valuable. The creation becomes more important. They worship and serve the creation. And so as creation and the four-footed animals and all those other things, as their value increases, right? What happens to the value of people? Their value decreases. The plants, the animals, the land, the sea, those are all things that are considered sacred while the humans are actually the problem. What part of Genesis is this, um, is this mindset a rejection of? Oop, there's a letter missing there. There is no chicken in Genesis. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the flying creatures of the sky, over the livestock, over the whole earth, and over every crawling creature that crawls on the land. God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is what they're rejecting. If there is no God, then there is no image of God in which we are made. No imago Dei. We are nothing more than an animal. No different than any of the others. We're actually worse off because we're an animal that's convinced by the lie of our own self-importance and by the illusion of superiority. When you reject this, then that means that we're not supposed to rule over anything. We're not, we have no special status. We have no greater value than any other creature on the planet. And if there are too many of us, then we should be treated like the lemmings, right? What, are they, what happens when the lemming population grows too high? They all run off a cliff. You need to cull the population a little bit. Some will go so far as to see humanity more like a virus to the planet. You know, that uh, and through you know, climate change, global warming, all that stuff, we've given the planet a fever. That's how it's talked about. Here's a clip, again, from a movie, The Matrix, 1999. So this is 20-some-odd years ago. I'd like to while. share a revelation that I've had during my time here. It came to me when I tried to classify your species. I realized that you're not actually mammals. Every mammal on this planet instinctively develops a natural equilibrium with the surrounding environment, but you humans do not. You move to an area and you multiply and multiply until every natural resource is consumed. And the only way you can survive is to spread to another area. There is another organism on this planet that follows the same pattern. Do you know what it is? A virus. Human beings are a disease, a cancer of this planet. You are a plague. So, y'all seen that one before? That's, there are, you're supposed to think that that's the bad guy 
and that his ideas are wrong, but more and more people actually agree. That's an increasing, increasingly popular opinion. In this kind of mindset, there is no desire or reason to save humanity as a whole, much less is there a desire to save individual people. So what if you lose a few here and there? That's no big deal. So what if you kill a few here and there? It's no real loss because there's no God to care or hold us accountable. And again, that's also a rejection of Genesis. You know, Cain spoke to his, Abel, his brother, while they were in the field. Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Then Adonai said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? I don't know, he said. Am I my brother's keeper? So many people think it's no loss. Don't think they're going to be accountable to anybody, that anybody cares but God is different. And he says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. He can't speak for himself anymore. But that doesn't mean that God does not hear. So, so now cursed are you from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. I thought about it like this. This is another movie reference. It's Cain, Cain, we've got Cain here. He killed Abel. And what's the next line? Does anybody know it? See, nobody cares. That's what they think. With all the things that we've experienced, with all the people that have, have died in the last few years, nobody cares. Nobody's going to miss them. Who cares that uh, if you had a, a loved one in the hospital or, or in, the, in a nursing home, who cares that you didn't get to go in there and be with them? Because it's no big loss. The planet is better off. And then back with that passage, you know, male and female, he created them. I mean, my goodness, really? How could you go there in this modern world? I mean, is God a biologist? Hmm. Does he really know what a woman is? Does he know what a woman is? And then the worst part of it else, I think I just assumed God's pronouns. Oh, but wait, God, when you read in the word, he actually seems to prefer the he, him pronouns throughout all the scripture. So are we going to respect his, his preferred pronouns or not? See how this world is so messed up on things. Genesis is so outdated, even that when it says, you know, male and female, it seems to be, you know, insisting upon a gender binary. Oh, no. The whole book should be censored for misinf misinformation and transphobia in today's world. I mean, it even said that Adam was created first. <gasps> Can you see how much of the cultural discussion... How much of the, the craziness that's going on in our world right now is because our culture is rejecting Genesis. Do you see it? You know, because all of a sudden Paul even confirmed that Adam was created first. For Adam was formed first and then Eve. Also Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived, she fell into transgression, right? Oh, but how sexist, how misogynistic, how patriarchal. The future is female. Masculinity is toxic. Surely I'm not the only one that's heard about this stuff, right? All of this ridiculousness going on in our nation today is a rejection of Genesis. You know, the debate even that we had in the last 20 years about marriage. What is marriage? Is it, a, is it between one man and one woman? Or can you just make it whatever you want? 
The debate about marriage is only possible in a nation and in a culture that rejects the Bible's authority to define sexuality and proper relationships. Chapter 2. You know, Adonai Elohim said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Let me make a well-matched helper for him. Verse 24, this is why a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife and they become one flesh. And if you'll remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago, you know, in all of these issues about sexuality and other related issues and food and all that kind of stuff, it boils down to three primary points. Does God have the best knowledge? Right. Well, if you don't believe there is a God, then clearly his opinion doesn't matter. And then does God, if there is one, does God express or have any desire to regulate whatever the issue is? Clearly on the issue of male and female marriage, does he have an opinion about that? And have an opinion about it should go a certain way? Yes, he does. But the real kicker question is does God have the authority? That's really what it all boils down to. Our culture is not just rejecting one of these things, it's rejecting all of them. It's rejecting all of them, especially anybody who says God has the authority. And it's not limited to adults, it's not limited to those types of things. Even our children are the target. They are not off limits. That's why you know, elementary school curriculum is saturated with pornographic content. That's why libraries are allowing the drag queen story hours to confuse children and teach them to reject the foundation of male and female. So in the future, you know, younger generations are going to be more and more will reject one of the most beautiful aspects of life. One of the first commands that God gave to humanity. Right? He created humankind in his image. The image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the land and conquer it. Well, I mean, that's obviously a problem in today's world. Because there's too many of us already. And so more and more of the culture is saying, well, you should delay having children because they're a, a burden financially. You know, you won't want to, you, you won't want to be able to, you won't be able to get the job that you want. Uh, you won't be able to have the life that you want if you're tied down by children. You'll just have a dog or something. Right? Just this week, I think it was this week, the, the, the candidate, the Democrat candidate for governor in Georgia stated that the freedom to kill their children through abortion up to the moment of birth, even after birth, if they happen to survive the procedure, uh, is one of the most essential, important economic issues that people in Georgia need to have in, uh, enshrined. They have to be able to kill their children in order to be secure financially. And then there are those that say that children are actually a threat to the planet. Now, this one is, this is a, a, I guess, a, a, a moment. I don't think it was written by somebody who actually believes this, but is just showing the, the kind of attitude. It says, you know, when I was just, just stop for a second and really look at this perfect little miracle we created, I can't help but feel a deep and profound sense of guilt for adding to the carbon footprint. And that's really how some people think. You know, it's better not to have any. You know, maybe China wasn't so wrong with their one-child policy after all. Maybe it's justified to inject people with an experimental substance that causes miscarriages and lowers fertility rates and birth rates everywhere that it's implemented. Maybe you're justified to do that. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's maybe most of our problems, most of our fights, and our worldview clashes come from a rejection of the very first pages of the Word of God. 
which leads to a rejection of Messiah. One of the reasons why we have forgotten, and this is the challenge for us, one of the reasons that our culture has forgotten and rejected creation is because we fail to follow God's own example. And we fail to follow, we've forgotten one of the primary purposes of the fourth commandment. You know, in Genesis chapter 2, it says God completed on the seventh day his work that he made. And he ceased on the seventh day from all his work that he made. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, for on it he ceased from all his work that God created for the purpose of preparing. He stopped for the seventh day. He laid that example down for his people. He lived by the rules that he wanted to have his people live by. And as our culture, when this decision to move away from Shabbat, from the Sabbath, occurred, how many ever centuries ago it was, the effect, the long-term effect of that decision was to stop, why do I need this? Because that's part of the commandment, Exodus 20. You know, remember Yom Shabbat, to keep it holy. You are to work six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Shabbat to Adonai your God. In it you shall not do any work, because again, that was how he lived for us. Not you, nor your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your cattle, nor the outsider that is within your gates. What's the reason? What's the example? For in six days Adonai made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Thus Adonai blessed Yom Shabbat and made it holy. He set it apart as a day of meeting, of coming together as his people. So one of the main reasons why our culture, this is, this is a long-term symptom The reason why we are rejecting creation is because we have re rejected the Sabbath as a culture. Keeping the Shabbat is a sign, is an indicator that you walk in God's shadow, that you walk in his ways, the way that Yeshua himself walked, the way that the apostles walked. And when he had arguments and discussions and, and conversations about Shabbat, he was not arguing about which day, but he argued about maybe how to properly keep it. And, uh, and some of the additions and subtractions that were going on in keeping the day. He wasn't arguing about the day. The only reason that we live and operate on a seven-day week is because of the pattern that God set in Genesis. There is no other reason. And it ties us to creation. It ties us to God's work. It ties us to God's purposes. It ties us to God's love. And what our nation, what our culture needs more than anything is to return to God and his ways. Amen. Believing and trusting in the creation account in Genesis, worshiping the creator more than the created because he is God and we are not. And as we were reading about earlier, he, share, he does not share his glory with another. We must stand firm and shine, shine that light that is the word of God. Because it's all scripture that is God-breathed, including Genesis. And it lays that foundation for everything that we believe. It explains why the world is the way it is. It explains our need for Messiah to come and save us, to redeem us. It explains how we are saved and how we must live in response to our redemption. That's what scripture does. And if you reject the first few pages, what do I need with the rest of it? So we need to believe it more and not less, right? This is what we need to believe more in our day. It's what our culture needs to believe more. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 